Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled How to Improve HER2 Testing Accuracy, Incorporating the 2018 ASCO CAP Focused Update. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Hadi Yazaji, the Medical Director of Vitro Molecular Laboratories in Miami, Florida. Dr. Yazaji's area of expertise is breast pathology and breast cancer biomarkers, especially HER2 protein and gene testing. Dr. Yazaji has received several prestigious achievement awards, including Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society and the Southern Medical Association Pathology Section Achievement Award. He has also co-authored over 55 publications in peer-reviewed journals. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hadi Yasaji. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Dr. Yasaji? Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for the nice introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation. Um, so we, uh, uh, I have a couple disclosures uh, uh, to make, which are on the slide, and I would like to dedicate the talk to all of the breast cancer survivors, including her two positive uh, patients. Um, so, just a quick word about myself with uh, HER2. Uh, uh, I believe uh, we published uh, one of the first, if not the first, quality assurance programs on HER2 testing with fish. You know, when I was a resident uh, in pathology prior to, it actually toward the end of my residency and beginning of my uh, first fellowship, uh, that's when. Uh, therapeutic applications uh, of uh, anti-HER2 targeted therapy became uh, available and approved uh, by the regulatory agencies. And, uh, and But nobody taught us how to uh, perform the test, how to interpret the test. So I have to confess, I'm actually a self-taught fish pathologist. Nobody taught me how to read fish slides. Um, and the first time I was introduced to the term, to the acronym FISH, which is fluorescence in cytohybridization, um, is when uh, I believe uh, uh, there was a talk at the, at the um, Corsair Children's Hospital by a renowned uh, uh, cytogeneticist, actually, uh, Dr. Hirsch, and he was talking about the use of this new test, new technology called FISH. Uh, to detect uh, fragile X syndrome, you know, uh, and uh, that was uh, just a basically a grand round presentation in 1993, I believe, and uh, nothing else happened after that until 99, when Fish was approved as one of the testing modalities in uh, for her too. And uh, I was asked as a junior pathologist by my senior pathologist. All right, you're going to start our FISH program. Great, uh, wonderful, exciting, but how do we do it? So actually, uh, I designed a quality assurance program to correlate between IHC and FISH, and we published our findings in uh, 2004. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to participate in the ASCOCAP um, task force discussions. Uh, I was not, my name is not included in the articles because I was representing one of the commercial laboratories, so we are not supposed to be co-authors, uh, but we participated in the setting the guidelines and the discussions. Uh, our laboratory uh, adjudicates the discrepant HER2 status uh, between oncotype results and uh, the originating HER2 results, whether the testing was done by immunostochemistry or FISH. And uh, we actually validated uh, some of the commercially available HER2 assays, and, and that would be uh, actually another disclosure. Um, developed an assay to use immunofluorescence and FISH uh, uh, in special settings uh, where uh, it is necessary to localize the target area better. Uh, because the, with the fish, it is difficult to recognize the topography, uh, where the tumor is, the invasive tumor, where the DCIS is, if there is DCIS, and where the benign areas uh, are. Uh, 
So this is the agenda. We're going to have a quick introduction and jump straight through into uh, some common misconceptions. After that, we will discuss uh, the focused updates, um, and then we'll spend a few minutes talking about these gray, gray zone tumors, what I would like to refer to them as gray zone tumors. And then we'll mention uh, the, some special scenarios. Uh, you know, I have personally looked at over 23,000 uh, fish slides uh, related to HER2 in breast cancer. So I, have, uh, I can say that I, I have seen it all, actually. Uh, so we'll we'll go over some of these special scenarios and then spend the last few minutes to discuss how to improve uh, her to testing accuracy. And these are helpful hints that I apply myself. So everything I say here, everything I advocate, I actually do. So what I do, what I say, I do. <laughs> so and then we'll open it to uh, questions and we'll be mindful of the time. Hopefully, there will be sufficient uh, amount of time for questions afterward. Um, so this is a kind of a probe diagram. So the HER2 uh, fish assay includes two probes, uh, one that targets the actual gene, which is a locus-specific probe. Uh, the gene is located on the sh long arm of chromosome 17, and it's actually close enough to the centromere, uh, which uh, poses some issues, actually, which we'll, we'll uh, briefly touch on later. And then the control probe is the centromere uh, probe, uh, with uh, the green uh, color. Okay, so to the right uh, of, uh, of that uh, chromosome map, uh, there is an illustration of a negative result, which is basically what you see in about 80% of breast cancers. Um, and then uh, underneath that, a positive result, where, which, we, which you, we, you would see in the remaining uh, percentage. Uh, now, um, the uh, mechanism of HER2 protein expression is gene amplification. Uh, now, that covers the vast majority of scenarios. Now, it doesn't cover 100% of them. There are exceptions. But these exceptions, in my opinion, are exceedingly rare. So HER2 protein expression is a direct result of HER2 gene amplification, again, with rare exceptions. And we do see these rare exceptions every once in a while. Now, given the fact that the drug targets the protein and doesn't target the gene, uh, the protein status becomes more informative for treatment decisions than gene status. And that's an important point from a therapeutic standpoint. So if there are oncologists listening to this talk, anytime there is a discrepancy, which is, in my opinion, exceedingly rare between the protein status and the gene status, anytime there is a discrepancy, we rely more on the protein status than the gene status for treatment purposes, okay? Because again, the drug doesn't target the gene, it targets the protein. So that's important to remember. But the good news is, uh, the, those scenarios where there is discrepancy are few and far between. So this illustrates a HER2 negative tumor on the left side with a negative immunohistochemistry and a negative uh, fish associated with it, and a HER2 positive tumor on the right side with a positive HER2 uh, protein expression, which is basically a membranous chicken wire pattern and a positive fish uh, assay, which shows an increased number of those red-colored uh, uh, gene-labeled uh, probes. I'm sorry, fluorescently labeled probe. So uh, just a very quick word about the targeted therapy biology. There are, uh, we're not going to get into the um, pathways, the cancer pathways uh, associated with uh, HER2 gene expression, but just a quick word about the how the increase um, copy number of the gene leads to an increase of protein copy number and how that um, affects the biology of HER2 positive breast cancers. We actually don't know the exact answer, but it seems like uh, the dimerization, just by the fact that 
the HER2 receptors become extremely numerous, uh, then the process of dimerization of two HER2 um, receptors next to one another, or that's called homodimerization, or um, heterodimerization between a HER2 receptor and another epidermal growth factor receptor family protein, whether it's HER1, HER4, or HER3, that dimerization triggers these uh, pathways, uh, basically activates these pathways and enables them to um, send signals uh, downstream that will really affect the potential aggressiveness of the cancer cell and the cancer itself, okay? So let's jump straight into some misconceptions. And that's really uh, basically a summary of the phone calls I get from my colleagues who are either oncologists or pathologists asking me, hey, you probably messed up my, the results of my patient. Didn't you uh, pay attention to the tumor grade and whatnot? So we'll go over these um, one by one. So the um, first of all, uh, one of these misconceptions is low-grade tumors are always HER2 negative. That's actually right and not right, you know. So that is correct uh, in the majority of the cases, but not always correct. And, and then the special type tumors like lobular, mucinous, and tubular tumors uh, are always HER2 negative. Again, that is largely correct, but uh, has some exceptions, which we will go over and tumor with incomplete membranous signal are HER2 negative. That is not necessarily true. And then the last one is most HER2 positive tumors are high grade. That also is not necessarily true. We will go over some examples to illustrate the point of each one of these items. So this is a, a tumor on low magnification. It looks like, well, that's a Nottingham grade one tumor, which is true, that is a grade one tumor. <clears throat> and it should not be HER2 positive as a result of that. Well, lo and behold, this is the HER2 status of this tumor by IHC and by FISH. And HER2 is definitively and un unequivocally positive on this tumor that has a Nottingham grade 1 or uh, phenotype. But if we look at the tumor nuclei up close, we, we notice that actually they're not necessarily they don't have a nuclear score of one. They have a nuclear score of two and uh, focally three even. So that is the point I wanna illustrate. Tumors with a nuclear score of higher than one, all bets are off. So you can actually have a Nottingham grade one tumor that is HER2 positive. And I just showed you one example of that. Now that is admittedly, that is not common, but it happens, and we should be aware of that phenomenon, that basically uh, what I tell pathologists is all of you are molecular pathologists, whether you like it or not, because you look at the h &E, and when you look at the h &E slide, you're looking at the nuclei, and the nuclei have the blueprint of the cell, and the blueprint includes the DNA, and the, the DNA is really important. So in my opinion, the Nottingham score uh, should incorporate the, if you look at the nuclear score, the Nottingham grade has the nuclear tubular and pleomorphism, uh, I'm sorry, nuclear pleomorphism, tubular score, and mitotic index. Uh, if you take the uh, nuclear score in isolation, uh, any tumor that has a nuclear score of one, which is extremely low grade, almost like benign, uh, these tumors are never ever HER2 positive. And I use the word never, actually. I've never seen one that's HER2 positive with a nuclear score of one. But once the nuclear score is two and higher, actually you can have, potentially, you can have uh, HER2 protein expression as a result of gene amplification. Those tumors with protein expression secondary to gene amplification, the, if you look at the copy number of the genes, uh, it actually is low, but it's positive when it is positive. Uh, so this is an example of one of these scenarios where a grade one tumor is actually HER2 positive. And that's one of the most common phone calls I get, like, oh, you messed up the score of my tumor. No, I didn't. It just happened that the nuclear score is more than one. And, and if we have that, it's okay for any breast cancer to be HER2 positive. Majority of them are not, but there are exceptions. I showed you one of them. 
Now, uh, this tumor is, uh, you know, any pathologist would look at this, would say, okay, this looks like a lobular tumor, which is correct. That's an invasive lobular carcinoma. And guess what? It is positive for HER2 protein expression. That's a three plus signal that I don't think anybody would argue against. And, but we look at the tumor cells up close again. These tumor cells are higher score. They have a higher nuclear score than, a, than your classical lobular cancers. And they have a higher nuclear score. Therefore, they can be positive. Majority of lobular cancers are not positive, but the tumors with a higher nuclear score, especially the pleomorphic lobulars, can be, can be occasionally positive for HER2 status. And this is the fish result. Again, on this tumor, we do see definitive amplification, but the number of gene copies is not exceedingly high. It's still in the single digits, like seven to nine, uh, but it's not uh, higher than 10. And that's typical of these tumors when they are positive, in my exper experience. This is an example of a tumor that anybody would call mucinous carcinoma, and that's fine, uh, but this tumor is also positive, you know, for HER2 protein expression. Uh, again, we look at the nuclei up close. The nuclear score, the nuclear score is not necessarily one. It's actually two. So any of these, and FISH is positive in this. Again, it's generally largely a single digit uh, copy number, but it looks like actually double digit, but in the lower double digit uh, in this case, like maybe 12 copies uh, on average. So these tumors can be positive. Generally speaking, they're negative, but I would like to alert the pathologists in the audience uh, that when you have a mucinous tumor with a nuclear score of higher than one, I actually personally do not call it mucinous. I would say invasive ductal carcinoma, maybe you can say mucinous features, uh, you know, but I will alert the oncologist that the nuclear score is higher than one and should not be called mucinous because biologically it's not going beha to behave like your typical uh, mucinous tumor. So let's now spend a few minutes on the FOCUS uh, 2018 update, which I actually participated in and was a lively discussion with a number of very experienced colleagues. Um, so uh, we have a scenario here where the ratio is over two, but the average HER2 copy number is less than four. And I have a cartoon of a tumor cell with three copies, three or two copies, but one chromosome 17 copy. So if you divide three over one, you get a ratio of three that's higher than two, but the average HER2 copy number is less than four. Now, if you recall, um, according to the 2013 guidelines, this tumor with this kind of a ratio um, score uh, would be actually called positive. And that was one of the most contentious topics uh, uh, discussed in the, during the 2013 guideline deliberation because the pathologists in the room really didn't want to call these tumors positive, but the oncologist wanted to give the patient the benefit of the doubt and see uh, if we treat these patients, what the outcome would be um, after um, data would accumulate, which is fine with me. Uh, so the 2018 guidelines actually reversed these tumors and would default to the HER2 protein status in these tumors to determine uh, FISH status. Uh, this is the other category where the ratio score is less than two, but the HER2 copy number is more than six. So that is uh, a group uh, three, the previous one. This one is group two, this is group three. Okay, these used to be called positive flat out, but uh, now we have to defer to uh, HER2 protein status. And then the largest category uh, among these is basically group four tumors, uh, which has a ratio of uh, still less than two, but an average HER2 copy number between four and six. Okay, so we'll go over these one by one. Obviously, immunistic chemistry, there was no change to, no significant change to the designation of HER2 uh, protein expression. Um, and then just a very quick word about FISH single probe. My understanding is vast majority of uh, laboratories, when I get the CAP survey, uh, I look at the numbers of labs that do HER2 single probe test. And these labs are rare, actually, that do a single probe test. 
Uh, so this is a diagram for the single probe test. It, it's actually more simple because you don't have a ratio score. Um, but the more complicated ones are the uh, tumors uh, with, uh, you know, when you do the testing with a dual probe, because you have to do a ratio score, but you still have to pay attention to the single per two average copy number. So these tumors are grouped in uh, five different groups. As a result, we talked about group two, three, and four in the middle. Uh, group one is your straightforward group uh, with uh, positive results, which is basically 15 to 24 or 20 percent of breast cancers. And that is the group of tumors with a ratio of more than two and an average copy number of more than four uh, or equal, equal to or greater than four. And then on the far right side of the slide, we have group five with a basically straightforward negative result uh, with an average copy number of uh, less than four and a ratio score of less than two. That is the most common setting. And in between, we have group two, three, and four, and we're going to spend more time on these. Um, with the dual color, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this diagram, uh, which you have in your handout. but. Uh, Basically, group two is, uh, we talked about a uh, ratio of, uh, of higher than two, but an average copy number of less than four. And uh, these tumors, uh, when we do IHC, so IHC, immunohistochemistry, is the adjudicator of HER2 fish status. And that's a new thing that was implemented and introduced uh, as a result of the 2018 focused update. Um, which basically says if you have a tumor that is a group two, okay, you're going to actually do immunohistochemistry regardless if you did it before you did fish or you uh, you're uh, or you're going to do it after you do fish. Now my my suggestion to you is to always do immunohistochemistry because you may end up with some uh, even though you do fish on everything, but always do immunohistochemistry. Uh, because you may end up uh, with uh, a scenario where the gene status is negative, but the protein status is positive. So this is one of those scenarios where the protein status will determine the gene status. So basically, to simplify things, uh, you don't have to look at the diagram, just you can listen to me. Um, if the protein status is uh, shows a one plus or two plus signal, uh, then we would call the fish uh, study negative. If the protein status is three plus, then we would call the fish study positive, which is, I think, is a good approach, and I would agree with. Now, group three tumors uh, is the one that has a higher copy number, uh, equal to or greater than six. And uh, these tumors, uh, but the uh, ratio is uh, less than two, uh, and these tumors have that because of an increased copy number of the control probe, which is chromosome 17 centromere probe. Now, these used to be called positive uh, straight out, but now we uh, subject them to the exact same algorithm we subject group two. So if HER2 IHC status is uh, one plus or zero negative, we call these tumors negative. If it's three plus positive, we call them positive. The only difference between this and group two and subsequent group four, which we will see in a minute, is when IHC shows an equivocal signal, actually we do call this tumor positive. Now, in my personal experience, uh, when I get a tumor like this with a copy number of six and higher and a ratio of less than two, um, Generally speaking, IHC status is actually positive. So I don't have to worry about IHC being negative. Um, but if IHC shows an equivocal 2 plus signal, we would call these tumors actually positive. Now, the next tumor, which is uh, group uh, four, which is really the most common scenario in these gray zone uh, tumors, group two, three, and four, with group four, uh, it is exactly the same algorithm of group two. So if you have an IHC signal intensity of either zero, one, or two plus, we would call the tumor negative by fish. If IHC status is three plus positive, we call the tumor positive by fish. So that's identical to group two, 
but group three is different. Now, if we put all these together in a single slide, uh, basically on the left, uh, you have IHC scores, and on the right, you have fish scores, and the combination of these two would uh, dictate the HER2 fish status. So again, to recap, uh, tumors with a zero or one plus uh, signal by IHC would be called negative across the board by fish, regardless of the group designation. Uh, tumors that are I, that show IHC three plus by uh, signal, which is positive, they would be called positive by fish, regardless of the group designation. The only difference where fish group designation makes a difference uh, is when we have an equivocal uh, IHC 2 plus score, uh, but the tumor shows a group three status by fish, which is basically an average of six and higher or two copy numbers, but a, but a ratio score of less than two. These tumors, if IHC shows two plus, they would actually be called uh, positive, okay? So, uh, that is the only difference. So that's a nice slide that I put together to illustrate, to summarize the entire uh, situation with these gray zone, gray zone tumors. Now, my prediction, which actually is correct, I, I made this slide uh, um, right at the beginning uh, in, in June of uh, 2019 uh, to, sh to predict that actually we will, we will end up, as a result of the focused update, we will end up with a higher number of um, HER2 negative tumors as a result, which is true. And that percentage is, is at least higher by 5%. Now, to recap the guidelines, um, there was actually heavy reliance on the, if you look at bullet number four, uh, there was heavy reliance on the NS, NSABP uh, B47 trial, um, which I have a little bit of a problem with because they lumped uh, patients with one plus and two plus scores together and they were not really stratified. And uh, patients with one plus and two plus scores, they were excluded from the treatment trial, from the treatment group, they did not qualify. So in my opinion, actually, generally speaking, the focused update did a very good job um, looking at these gray zone tumors in a more granular way and incorporated the protein status to stratify these tumors as to which ones should be called negative and which ones should be called positive. So I'm fairly satisfied with the uh, guidelines. Now, just a quick word about gray zone tumors. Gray zone tumors, uh, the way I define them, don't uh, are not exclusive to groups two, three, and four. In my opinion, you can actually have a positive tumor that we call positive, no problem, uh, but that's also a gray zone tumor. For example, if you have a tumor with four HER2 copies on average and two chromosome copies, we would call that straightforward positive. It's basically group one. But to me, that tumor is no different than groups two, three, and four, because the copy number is low. So the point I'm trying to make is when you have a tumor with a copy number near uh, the cutoff, you really want to slow down and look at those tumors uh, more carefully to, to sort them out, you know, uh, because to me, they're just like group two, three, and four, but they're classified as either, either group one or group five, depending on um, the count. And these tumors seem to have a biology that is a little bit more aggressive, by the way. This is an example of a tumor that shows um, a, uh, let's say, six over four copies. Um, and it's inside a vessel. And I, and I put a dash line to highlight the endothelial lining of the capillary where these tumor cells are inside. So that's a vascular invasion. Vascular invasion is, is a sign of aggression. It's an aggressive tumor, obviously is a poor prognostic sign. So that's a patient, that's a tumor with a poor prognostic sign with a gray zone score. So the gray zone scores are not limited to low grade tumors. Actually, the, the, you see high grade tumors with more gray zone results, you know, so we have to be careful with those tumors. Another one, look at the nuclear grade, it's actually high. This is roughly speaking three over two. 
This is four over three, again, roughly speaking. Um, that again is the high grade tumor. I mean, you look at these nuclei, they're pleomorphic, they're large, they're, they have an irregular contour, all of the cytologic features that we recognize as, as high grade. So what do I do, uh, uh, you know, uh, to manage these gray zone tumors? Obviously, I follow the guidelines. I still follow the guidelines. But I pay more attention to the hormone receptors, um, obviously HER2 IHC status, and also other things like T67. T67 is very important to look at to stratify these tumors if it's high uh, and happens to be ER positive, it would be luminal B tumor, basically. Um, I look at PR. PR, if it's negative or low, that actually is a poor prognostic marker when you have PR being negative or low, regardless of ER status, especially when it's accompanied by a relatively higher P67. P67 doesn't have to be as high as 20%. It could be between 10 and 20% with a, with a low PR status then that tumor would actually qualify as a luminal B and biologically and clinically probably would, would behave as a luminal B tumor. And then there is space for the risk assessment assays, which is the favorite uh, thing for medical oncologists to order to sort out these patients and they get her to status indirectly. Um, now, just a word of caution, these risk assessment, risk assessment assays that uh, incorporate HER2 testing results in them, they're really not approved by the FDA for determination of HER2 status. So it's just an informative assay, but it's not a approved to determine HER2 status with, again, eligibility of uh, treatment. So that's a word of caution. Um, so this is another way just by text to illustrate what I just said uh, uh, in the previous uh, slide. Um, and uh, the practical approach, you know, which I hope would be incorporated in the next guidelines, which I would like to call these tumors HER2 low, the gray zone tumors call them HER2 low instead of either positive or negative. So there will be three categories, HER2 positive, that is kind of straightforward, HER2 negative, that's straightforward. And then in between, we call it HER2 low. And that encompasses group three, two, three, and four. You know, so HER2 low, obviously we don't know how they behave. Probably biologically and clinically, they behave more like a negative tumor, but we don't know yet. All right, so um, let's spend a few minutes on the special scenarios. I think we're not behind the time. Uh, it's been 20 minutes since I started. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk about heterogeneity. We'll talk about, we'll talk about polysomy versus co-amplification, and then we'll show a few examples of uncommon hybridization patterns. So this is a tumor which clearly shows uh, heterogeneity. You have tumor cells with basically no amplification and other next to them adjacent tumor cells with actually a very high number of gene copies, significant amplification. So that's heterogeneity. It does happen, but it's not common to be honest with you. I don't see it commonly. And that's heterogeneity by immunohistochemistry that parallels the heterogeneity with fish And that's another example of heterogeneity where you have occasional, just only occasional positive cells, but the majority of the tumor is either two plus or negative. And now this is an important uh, slide because it shows uh, the tumor actually is barely two plus and it's actually negative by fish. Uh, but the, uh, there is an associated in situ component and the in situ component is positive. So these tumors, uh, you know, because um, if if those if if this kind of a tumor uh, is sent to uh, for oncotype DX uh, uh, risk assessment, sometimes you may get actually a positive HER2 result, and in your laboratory as a pathologist, you reported HER2 result as uh, negative or equivocal by IHC and maybe negative by FISH. And then you get the result from uh, uh, of Oncotype DX as positive, uh, HER2 status being positive. What would have happened in a case like this is because the micro dissection doesn't really factor in the DCIS. It's not, uh, you know, like 
scientific macro dissection where you only dissect the invasive tumor. Uh, HER2 status is really a reflection of the DCIS in this case. And that's important, you know, and, and the company that does the uh, Oncotype DX uh, pay att pays attention to this and they actually send the slides to us uh, to adjudicate HER2 status when there's a discrepancy between the original pathology uh, HER2 result and the Oncotype DX. What we do is we dissect, uh, we map these tumors with immunohistochemistry and fish, and we show them HER2 status by on the in situ component and invasive component. So what they do is they take the slide, we digitally scan it for them, and they actually only dissect the invasive component and repeat the whole assay, repeat the whole risk assessment assay to completely exclude the in situ component, which actually is an accurate reflection of the risk associated only with the invasive disease, you know, uh, which is actually important. Um, all right, so let's talk about some uh, uncommon hybridization patterns. Uh, this is a tumor with an amplification of chromosome 17 centromere. Uh, this does happen. It's extremely rare. Uh, it was described uh, for the first time, actually, in 2006 by my colleague and friend, Dr. Megan Troxel, uh, when she was at uh, OHSU, uh, she described it for the first time. Um, this is an example of monosomy. Now, this is more common. This is more common where you see a single copy of chromosome 17. Um, and uh, regardless of her two protein uh, uh, gene status, so you see a single single copy. So that is probably a reflection of a deletion of the other allele. We don't know unless we do uh, a race EGH on these tumors. But this is more common. I, I actually do see this about uh, one out of 50 tumors. So it's 2%. 2% of the tumors have this kind of uh, genotype. And this is exceedingly rare where we actually have a HER2 deletion. There's a deletion of HER2 uh, gene, either a single probe deletion or even double probe deletion. But in this case, it's a single probe deletion. That happens, but again, it's exceedingly rare, but I have seen it. <clears throat> this one is the other way where you have a, a combination of HER2 gene amplification associated with monosomy. And then with immunostochemistry, uh, what I refer to these uh, to this phenotype is the equivalent of the quote-unquote bile canalicular phenotype, which is similar to the bile canalicular pattern of polyclonal CEA or CD10 or villain that we see in hepatocellular carcinoma. We occasionally see this pattern with, her, uh, with breast cancers with regard to HER2 protein by immunostochemistry. And that should not actually be called negative. It should be called as equivocal, or you can call it indeterminate. If you're not comfortable calling it equivocal, you can call it indeterminate. And these uh, tumors, a small fraction of them, by the way, are is positive for HER2 gene amplification. So my recommendation is each time you see this kind of a, what I refer to as the biocanalicular pattern, you have to, I don't think you have a choice, you have to perform HER2 fish tests to sort these out. Majority of them are actually negative, admit, admittedly, but a minority of them is positive, and the minority that is positive shows a stronger signal of the HER2 membranous signal. So the point I'm trying to drive home here is you do not have to have a continuous circumferential signal around the cell. If you have a, a, a discontinuous signal like this one, which looks almost like a biocanalicular pattern, pay attention to it. Don't call it negative. Call it either 2 plus or indeterminate, which will trigger a fish test. And then the fish assay will really determine uh, HER2 status. It could be positive, could be negative. Majority are negative, but some are positive. Um, and again, this tumor, actually this very tumor you just looked at, has a positive uh, signal count with HER2. So HER2 is positive in this case by gene uh, status. Just a very quick word about polysomy versus co-amplification. This is the exact same tumor with two different filters used to take the picture. On the left, you have a HER2 
uh, gene, which shows an average of, I would say, six to seven copies. And on the right, you have chromosome 17 only, which shows an identical number of chromosome centromere copies. So what happened here? Is it polysomy? We used to think it's polysomy, um, which illustrated by the fact that there are just uh, an increased number of copies of chromosome 17 allele. We actually were wrong all along, uh, which we were proven wrong by uh, my very good friend, Dr. Shelley Gunn and her colleagues, uh, and also by a group from Italy the same year uh, in 2009, uh, the two investigative groups uh, published uh, papers showing um, basically uh, if you do CGH testing, um, polysomy of chromosome, chromosome 17 in breast cancer at least is basically non-existent. Um, and that was, uh, you know, and you see the red uh, circle surrounding the chromosome 17, it says zero. So out of the 100 tumors that they ran CGH on to validate the assay for breast cancer, none of them showed polysomy. Uh, so uh, what we used to refer to as polysomy is actually not polysomy, which uh, probably uh, would be a result of potential co-amplification of the centromere along with the gene, kind of a low-level amplification. Um, I don't really have the answer, but, but it should not be referred to as polysomy anymore. Now, in the next few minutes, we're going to talk about how to improve the accuracy of HER2 testing using tools that we already have. We don't have to use some fancy other tests like quantitative PCR, which is a very good test, or CGH, which is a very good test. But in my opinion, we don't have to use those tests in the majority of, um, of cases. So um, what do we do? Uh, OK, um, the small tumor category, we'll, we'll go over that in the next uh, slide. A uh, tumor with a nuclear score of one, these are invariably negative. So looking at the morphology, looking at the nuclear score, if you feel as a pathologist that the nuclear score is one, these tumors should not be positive. And in my opinion, a nuclear score of one is the strongest predictor of a negative or two protein and gene status, actually. Now, tumor with key 67. So I really like to look at key 67. If you have less than 5%, these tumors uh, are not really supposed to be positive for HER2, but I cannot say they're never positive, but they're not supposed to be positive. So P67 is a good, really, adjunct to help you determine HER2 status indirectly. And then you have the specific histologic features. For example, the metaplastic carcinomas, uh, including spindle cell carcinoma, which is known also as a fibromatosis-like tumor. We published a study uh, as I was finishing my fellowship at uh, MD Anderson with Dr. Snage, showing that none of these tumors are actually positive. So spindle cell carcinomas, when you have a metaplastic carcinoma, whether it's spindle cell or maybe squamous, these tumors are, we can say with some confidence that they are invariably negative. Uh, for her to protein expression and gene amplification. And then you have these non-mammary tumors, for example, the salivary gland type tumors like the adenoid cystic carcinomas. It's not really, even though it's triple negative, but it's not your classical triple negative that looks basal-like. These tumors are triple negative. We say triple negative, meaning negative for her too. Almost always negative for her two protein expression and gene amplification, with rare exceptions. I used to say invariably negative until I learned my lesson. One time I had an adenoid cystic carcinoma that shows a low level uh, protein expression and gene amplification. So I stopped saying they were invariably negative, uh, almost invariably negative. Another special type is the micropapillary, the invasive micropapillary carcinoma. These tumors, it's like exactly flipping a coin. 50% <laughs> of them show positivity. So they have a higher percentage of them, of that group being positive uh, compared to general breast, invasive breast cancer, which is 15 to 20%. When it comes to invasive micropapillary carcinomas, these tumors, actually 50% uh, of them are positive. 
with a caveat, the ones that are positive, they do not show a higher, a very high HER2 gene copy number. So they show something in the single digits, usually seven, eight, nine, maybe 10, maybe 11, maybe 12, but not in the higher double digit. And then the actual tumors that are positive, what is the phenotype of these tumors? We're gonna go over that in the next slide, but let's first talk about the size of the tumor and how it impacts HER2 status, how it impacts the accuracy of HER2 status. Obviously the size doesn't change the status, but a tumor with a smaller size has a more likely tendency to, ha to have an accurate test result. And why is that? So I, I created the slides to illustrate my point. So if you have a larger tumor, generally speaking, we don't sample the entire tumor. So there's some of it left in the container. And when we sample it, let's say we take four slides, five, I'm sorry, four blocks or five blocks, six blocks. Okay, the, out of these six blocks, we only test one. So if there is heterogeneity, we really don't know about the rest of the blocks, the routine practice, and I'm not advocating for testing all of the blocks. No, one block is enough. But the denominator, because when we say 10% is the cutoff between positive and negative, right? Uh, when you have a small tumor, the entire tumor, more often than not, is sampled in a single block and is represented on a single uh, slide the entire tumor. So when we say, okay, we do have some heterogeneity with maybe 2% positive cells, so we're gonna call it negative. The denominator in this case is actually accurate because we have a full representation of the entire tumor when it's a small tumor. But when it's a large tumor and we have heterogeneity and we say, and, the, and, and we have some positivity, but it is less than 5% or 10%, we really don't have a clue about the denominator. 10% of what? 10% of tumor cells in a single block, but we don't have the rest of the blocks and we haven't sampled the entire tumor. So the accuracy of HER2 result is maximized when you have a small tumor, it's inversely related. When you have a large tumor, you may have to test additional blocks or maybe all the blocks when you have heterogeneity. So that's the point to take home is, Accuracy of HER2 status is inversely related, in my opinion, to the tumor size. Smaller tumors are represented on a single cassette, usually. Larger tumors are not. Now, what do HER2 positive tumors look like? We all have seen them, but I would like to describe them. You see the cytoplasm here on a low magnification. It looks a little bit uh, kind of pinkish almost like apocrine, but not exactly like apocrine. I like to call it, it's like a, almost like a hybrid between apocrine and squamous. So I like to call it hybrid squapocrine. <laughs> I like to use that term. Um, and uh, this tumor is clearly positive and up close, obviously uh, the nuclear grade is, is nuclear score is two to three, it's, it's a pleomorphic. Uh, but you look at the cytoplasm, there are two things about the cytoplasm. Not that it's only pink, but also if you look at the NC ratio, the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, the ratio is not high. It actually is low because there's a ton of cytoplasm. I don't know what it is that um, enable these HER2 positive tumors to, to make a lot of cytoplasm. So as a result, the nucleus still looks ugly but the NC ratio is actually, generally speaking, it's low. Not always, but generally speaking, it is low. That's another tumor that looks more like a, almost like a sugar tumor. You know, you have a more clear cell cytoplasm uh, and the, with a low NC ratio, look at the NC ratio, it's not necessarily high, it's actually low. But you look at the nuclei, they are ugly. They, are, they have a score of two or even three in some cases. That's clearly a positive tumor. And then you have the micropapillary, obviously. When you have a micropapillary, invasive micropapillary carcinoma, uh, when, sorry about that. When you have an invasive micropapillary carcinoma, uh, the 50% of these tumors are positive, okay? And uh, the signal is not continuous. That's another thing to pay attention to. You're not going to get a circumferential signal in these tumors. 
Uh, that's as good as it gets. If you want to call this 2+, plus, I'm fine with that. But when you do fish on it, actually, there is a positive signal. And uh, notice the copy number is not necessarily high. It's in the single digits. And that's my experience with these numbers. So to put it all together, uh, how do we perform the QA program at our institution? Um, the invasive tumor is verified on the h &E slide, obviously. And our lab is a hybrid lab. We do get cases from the local community where we diagnose the invasive cancer on core biopsy, usually from imaging centers. But the majority of our HER2 testing is actually referred to us by other pathology uh, labs. Uh, so we make an h &E, We look at it. Obviously, we make sure there is an invasive tumor on the h &E, And we always invariably, even when the client asks us to do fish only, we invariably perform IHC, and I refer to it for tumor mapping. We map the tumor, make sure if there is heterogeneity, if there are hot spots, we, we focus on those hot spots when we uh, interpret the, the fish results. Okay, so that's a tumor mapping. Okay, and then when I'm looking at the fish slide, I always look at the HE and IHC at the same time I'm looking at the fish slide. Okay. So we have a QA program looking at the tumor, nuclear score, tumor histologic grade, IHC score, and FISH score one by one, side by side, and in that specific uh, sequence. Uh, the reading is performed by a pathologist, myself or someone else, and uh, I am purposely blinded to the previous result. I don't want to bias myself if, the, if we have a a previous sample on this same patient, I, would, I don't want to bias myself when I'm interpreting the new sample. But what I do is when I get to verify the case in the final report, I look at the previous studies and I do compare, obviously. And if there is discrepancy, I go back to the slides and I dig a little bit deeper uh, of the new slides and the old slides to see why there is discrepancy. And of course, the metrics are mandated by the CLIA and the College of American Pathologists or other regulatory agencies. So we perform the metrics. I prefer monthly metrics over quarterly metrics. In case you have a little bit of a drift in your assay, you can catch it sooner. But the good news about this program is really what I like to refer to as real-time, real-time uh, quality control, where you're looking at the slides side by side for every tumor in real time before you report the status. And that's it. That's uh, if you look at, I actually took a picture of a folder with a few uh, breast cancers showing H and E, IHC and FISH, H and E, IHC and FISH. That is our quality assurance program. Um, and again, we talked about how we can predict HER2 status by looking at the H and E or even looking at the IHC, obviously. And finally, um, I have uh, put together a slide uh, that explains my approach to HER2 status. Uh, so obviously, on the let's focus first on the right side of the slide, where you have the HER2 negative tumors, that group five, um, and the, the HER2 low tumors, which I talked about, which is the gray zone, which encompasses group two, three, and four. And then uh, the HER2 positive tumors. Now, the HER2 positive tumors are not homogeneous. They are heterogeneous. How do I split them? I look at, first of all, I look at her, uh, ERPR status. Uh, I look at the nuclear score. I look at the morphology. And I look at HER2, uh, I'm sorry, T67 status. And it should make sense to separate these two buckets. So the, uh, what I like to refer to as the luminal HER2, which is basically ER positive, PR positive, uh, these tumors have a nuclear score of usually two, even when HER2 is positive, and the copy number is generally low in the single digits or low double digits. And then you look at T67, uh, the percentage of positive cells is between 10 and 20. Now, the tumors that are HER2 positive but ER negative, uh, these tumors have the typical, what I like to refer to as squapocrine uh, morphology. Uh, the nuclear score is higher, usually three. And then you look at the HER2 fish copy number, it's actually higher. It is, uh, it is not usually single digit, it's double digit, and usually it's high double digit. 
And then you look at T67 status, it's actually also high between 20 and 30 percent, and sometimes higher than 30 percent. That group of tumor, I like to refer to it as HER2 driven. So HER2 actually drives the biology and clinical behavior of those tumors, as opposed to the uh, other group of tumors that happens to be HER2 positive, but HER2 is really not the driver. It's not the driver. It just happens to be positive. These tumors, in my opinion, biologically and clinically, would behave as almost close to HER2 negative. Obviously, we still have to treat them as HER2 positive, uh, but keep in the back of our mind that these, probably the treatment, treatment HER2, anti-HER2 treatment in these patients is not as effective, and, and this is actually also confirmed by the uh, literature by some of the published literature. And so the uh, this is it. Um, I am uh, at the end now, and I think we did a good job. We got uh, 50 minutes uh, or less. Uh, so the focused update, uh, the 2018 focused update, really moved closer to incorporating uh, the protein status with the gene status almost on all tumors. Uh, the guidelines, obviously, uh, they already swung the pendulum in the negative result direction, um, which I actually welcome uh, to some extent. And then uh, it did not really solve the dilemma of the gray zone tumor, even though the oncologists are jubilant about the disappearance of the equivocal HER2 fish category. But that disappearance is actually artificial, so we really dichotomized, artificially dichotomized a continuous variable, in my opinion, uh, and did not eliminate the problem of gray zone tumors. We still have to address that. Um, so therefore, I personally proposed a three-tier scoring, uh, HER2 positive, HER2 negative, HER2 low. And I think Dr. Shelley Gunn, my colleague, who does a lot of uh, uh, CGH, Comparative Genomic Hybridization Testing, she does agree with that conclusion. Uh, and of course, correlation with immunistic chemistry and tumor histopathology and performing the metrics is really, in my opinion, mandatory in order to improve or to testing accuracy. This is really the most important statement, and this is the message I would like for everybody uh, to take home. And with that, I really appreciate your attention, and I welcome your questions at, uh, at, this, point, at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yazaji, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the, Q the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Our first question is, what do you do with low-grade tumors that have a HER2 positive status by either immunohistochemistry or FISH? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> Basically, I apply the same tools that I get in the toolbox. Basically, I, I always use the same tools I have in the toolbox. I pull them out. Uh, Low-grade tumors, generally speaking, are not supposed to be HER2 positive. But like I said earlier, uh, there are exceptions. And the exceptions follow a specific rule. That rule says, at least the rule that I observed over more than looking at more than 23,000 tumors is basically the nuclear score. If the nuclear score is one, uh, then the tumor should really be negative, should not be positive. I have not seen a tumor that is positive um, for her two with a nuclear score of one out of three. But when the nuclear score becomes higher than one, either two or three out of three, then all bets are off and the tumor actually is allowed, for the lack of a better word, is allowed to be HER2 positive. So it is perfectly fine for breast cancers to be positive when they are low grade with, a, with the condition that the nuclear score is higher than one. Now, if you have a nuclear score of one, and a positive status, you, you really should not have that combination. So you should, um, if you only have immunohistochemistry, chemistry, you should do fish. Maybe there's something wrong with the assay, with the IHC assay. Uh, you should do fish, and fish would be negative. And maybe the IHC assay shows some high sensitivity issues. Uh, sometimes the fixation of the tumor plays a role in bumping the HER2 status. 
Um, I have never seen a, a three plus positive tumor that is uh, with a artificially three plus signal by IHC, but I have seen tumors with like what looks like convincingly two plus signal, um, and, uh, and which is really not representative of two plus, but it's more like should be one plus. And the increase in the intensity is due to shorter fixation uh, of the tumor in formaldehyde. So what happens is when they get to the tissue processor, the next solution that they are hit with, uh, the tumor is hit with is actually alcohol. And alcohol brings up the signal, HER2 signal, you know, so HER2 likes alcohol. And, and so you get artificially a more intense HER2 protein copy by IHC, but you do fish uh, and, and you get negative results. So that's what I do with these tumors. Okay. And our next question is, can you please elaborate more on the HER2 driven tumors? Sure. So that is one of my favorite areas because that's where we need to get a little bit more granular and go beyond the dichotomy of positive versus negative. Okay. So having a HER2 positive status is not the end of the story. And that really shows where the medical oncologist, a very astute medical oncologist, would really look beyond the positive result. So they put it all together. So if the tumor is positive for her two protein expression and or gene amplification, and negative for hormone receptors with a really higher nuclear grade, but also a high key 67 for people who do perform key 67 uh, assay. Uh, if you put it all together, uh, a mm, tumor that is negative for hormone receptor expression, but positive for HER2, these are the tumors. This is the group of tumors where I personally feel that the patient gets the most benefit of anti-HER2 therapy. And that therapy is unopposed by the uh, hormone receptor status on the tumor because there is good literature, a couple of studies that show that patients who have positive hormone receptor status, for some reason, the positive status tends to block the beneficial effects of anti-HER2 therapy, as opposed to patients with a HER2-driven tumor where the protein the hormone receptor is actually completely negative. So that's why I like to call these tumors driven by HER2 because HER2 seems to really drive the biology and the clinical course in these patients. Okay, great. Well, those are all the questions we have. Thank you again, Dr. Hadi Yazuji, and thank you again to the audience um, for those outstanding questions. We hope you found today's presentation to be informative and insightful. This presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. Don't miss out on the other valuable presentations on our agenda. Visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again for your participation. And until next time, goodbye.